Hello, everybody, and welcome to Shaping Davos. Today, we're talking about public service and millennials closing the generational gap. Uh, we have two panelists joining us to discuss this, and so we can get uh, they are experts in their fields, and they're going to tell us a little bit about how we can make the public sector more attractive to millennials who are finding it hard to trust the public sector at the moment. Uh, with us, we have Scott Bryson, the President of the Treasury Board and Cabinet Minister of Canada. Welcome. Delighted to be Mr. here with Bryson, you, Mr. Bryson, thank you for being here today. Great to be here. And, of course, Paolo Gallo, the Chief Human Resources Officer at the World Economic Forum and a Transformation Coach as well. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure. We are also joined by four hubs from across the globe. Uh, we have with us Subu Kalpathi, lead consultant, people business, joining us from the Mumbai hub. Welcome, Subu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dennis Gursky from Kiev, an open data advisor to the Prime Minister of Ukraine. Thank you for joining us, Dennis. Thank you for inviting me here. And Gilberto, uh, Gilberto Mirando from Monterey, political scientist and consultant joining us. Thank you for being here. Hello, glad to be here. Um, just a special note, we were supposed to be joined by uh, the Tunis hub from Tunisia, but uh, there was an unfortunate, tragic accident, uh, and they lost one of their members just uh, a two days ago. Uh, this is in memory of Hiba Safi. She, ha she was working on the session from Tunis, and uh, the session is in a way sort of uh, for her memory and the effort that she has put. Uh, we want to thank, of course, Laurent Javaudin from Lyon for joining us on such short notice and accepting uh, to take uh, to fill in the shoes of the Tunis Hub. Thank you so much. Laurent is an investor and former international civil servant and diplomat from Lyon. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. We live in a world where millennials have access to social media networks, they're increasingly becoming entrepreneurs, and they're constantly looking for a brighter future. The public sector can seem like a bleak place for them to take part in, but they're constantly rating the public sector as least adapted to their current needs and future expectations. Uh, however, I came across an article when I was researching for this, during conducting my research for this specific session, uh, an article titled, Millennials are attracted to public service, but government needs to deliver. It was written by John Flato and Bob Lavinia, both experts in career consulting, and they were quoting uh, Universum, a global employer branding and research company, uh, which annually surveys college students, uh, college uh, undergraduate and MBA students, and the results and the polling results that they found were actually pretty impressive. They found that a survey had found out that 49 percent of students out of 65,000 surveyed said they were dedicated to a cause that made them feel they were serving a greater good when looking for a job. 57 percent of them said they were looking for job security, and 62 percent of them said they were looking for a work-life balance. Now, these were the top three answers, and it's a little bit about what, it's a little bit what the public sector is about and what it tends to offer. So there is an interest in the public sector. And we're here today to see how can it attract the best and the brightest of these future generations. And we're going to start with you, Mr. Scott Bryson. Um, can you tell us today uh, what you think are the main challenges for the public sector? Well, first of all, in some ways, my job is a little easier uh, since October 19th, uh, because on, on October 19th, we had a, an election in Canada when Justin Trudeau became prime minister. And one of the reasons why uh, he was elected prime minister um, is across Canada, he was able to engage young people. Mm -hmm. uh, never before had a Canadian political party gone from third place to first place yeah. in, in one election. And over a period of years, both in terms of his leadership campaign and in terms of the national campaign, he was successful in attracting some of the best and brightest young Canadians to his campaign. And since then, in appointing his cabinet, he appointed the most diverse cabinet in Canadian history, gender parity, the first cabinet with gender parity. Um, we have uh, a 30-year-old uh, Minister of International Development, Miriam Monsef, 
who actually came to Canada as an Afghani refugee, uh, who is now on the cabinet committee that I, on which I serve for the Syrian refugee process. It's, it's, it is a very um, compelling story we offer in Canada today. Uh, about a prime minister who is ambitious to transform the public service, mm -hmm. to make it more attractive for young people. Um, we have, a, as do a lot of governments today, we have a demographic reality where more people are re retiring from the public service than are joining. And we have what is the most educated, informed, and globally connected generation of young people who are somewhat skeptical about public service. We recognize we need to change um, elements of the public service. For instance, I mean, what is Google doing? The Google headquarters just opened in Canada. There are new Google headquarters. If you walk into a Google headquarters, it looks slightly different than if you walk into most government offices. Um, in terms of flexibility of work, in terms of work-life balance, in terms of innovation. I was talking to some public servants earlier today um, here in, in Davos, some Canadian public servants, who were telling me that the public service is too hierarchical. Uh, right. that we have to actually right. uh, change the way we make decisions, that we have to become more creative, uh, that we have to adapt more technologically. Um, we can change fundamentally mm -hmm. uh, a lot of elements of the public service, but what is really clear to me is that while young people can make a difference uh, in the future of the world in an NGO, the same smart, talented, um, idealistic young person can actually make a bigger difference in government if government gives them the tools to, to do that. So we have to make some changes, but right. young people have to also be open to the fact that you can really move the needle in terms of global progress in government. All right, thank you for that. Mr. Paolo Gallo, what do you think are uh, the main challenges today uh, for the public sector uh, in attracting millennials? Sure. Uh, well, there are many, uh, yeah. for sure, and uh, perhaps uh, as a bit of background, a uh, um, couple of numbers. The half a percent, uh, fifty percent of the population of the world have less than twenty-seven years old. Two uh, people at school, kids at school, I have a ten years old daughter, and there is sixty percent of chance is going to do a job that right now doesn't exist. Mm. Whatever we're doing right now, in thirty years, in terms of a métier, profession, jobs will not exist anymore. Um, so we need to also to grasp uh, that whatever we're doing now is going to be completely different sometimes in the future. Second, the theme of these uh, uh, annual meetings, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, help us to grasp uh, the, the, the magnitude of the changes. But I really wonder if in terms of people management, starting from the millennium, we have evolved our thinking, our practices, and our mental models to something that is applicable. Are we still using the Taylorism that was invented after the first industrial mm -hmm, revolution? Mm -hmm. And just to give you maybe some examples, and Scott mentioned uh, a few, few seconds ago, um, we still anchor the idea that you, know, you have to be nine to five uh, right. in, a working, in a working contest. And then the question is, does this apply, does this is appealable to, uh, to millennials? Mm -hmm. The second one is uh, we tell them what to do. So fundamentally, a cascading down objective to say, I'm telling you what to do and you've got to do it. And your career depends on this. The third one, career based on seniority. Uh, really? I mean, maybe millennials want to explore different methodology to progress. Objectives imposed by, from above, really, maybe I need to find out a sense of purpose that applies to me as an individual. So my point is fundamentally, or oh, another one that uh, Scott just mentioned, is a diversity. Diversity is not a quota, it's not a political slogan, it's what we became as humanity. And some countries, some organizations are doing beautifully, some don't, uh, and some even go in the opposite direction. So then the question is uh, uh, perhaps to revise some of the mental models or some of the assumptions that we've used since the first uh, Industrial Revolution, and by doing this, we will probably mm -hmm. be able to attract millennials that currently are a bit skeptical, despite, in my view, a very strong interest to participate for a purpose right, a right. bigger there than that. There is them. an interest, right? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Oh. So, just to speak to yes. that interest, one of the things that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau did upon be becoming Prime Minister mm -hmm. was reach out and ask for uh, uh, CVs from, from young people 
uh, interested in, in public service uh, to join our offices. We received uh, over 20,000 CVs. Uh, young people, in some cases, Rhodes Scholars and Fulbright Scholars and all, like just hyper bright, talented young people who uh, wanted to uh, get involved and uh, help build a better country and, and help want, wanting to help uh, Canada play a more important and progressive role in, on the world stage. That was, that, that was reassuring. I think the World Economic Forum itself Actually, my experience with young people who work with the forum, I think the World Economic Forum is actually doing a good job of attracting uh, well, bright is, young people uh, to, to its work. I was going to say this is part of shaping Davos, and uh, a lot of the people involved here, including myself, are global shapers, yeah, and yeah, it was part right. of uh, Mr. Schwab's uh, initiative to try to get younger people in. And I think it's very much what you said about the new... A cabinet that's t that took place in Canada with Mr. Trudeau uh, coming into uh, government, he, him himself being somebody who is um, going to attract millennials and offering open ideas and people from different and races and ethnic backgrounds. And, and if you look at, at the man, he, he, he's committed to open government, which is, and mm -hmm. open by default, mm -hmm. which is something that for millennials, I think is something that's, that's very important. Among other things, uh, our mandate letters as cabinet ministers uh, were made public, mm -hmm. so that the public can, can monitor uh, and hold us to account. Um, one of the, the things that uh, he's, 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 also, he's prime minister, he's also minister of youth, um, and he's taking that on personally because he views it as, as a really important objective for his government and for him personally to re-engage young Canadians in building a better country. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we're going, I'm going to ask our audience uh, who's watching this session to please engage uh, with, in social media. You can engage uh, in this discussion uh, via the hashtag uh, shaping talent. That's hashtag shaping talent. We just got uh, a tweet from Mayuri Batasharki. Uh, she's, from the, she's one of the Mumbai shapers. And she said that millennials want to work in public sector in India, for example, but corruption discourages them. And that's another uh, problem with governance. We're going to get back to that uh, in a couple of minutes. I'd like to turn our attention to our hub speakers. Uh, just to remind you, you each have two minutes to discuss and uh, to tell me what you think are the challenges uh, of the public sector. We can start with you, Mr. Alberto Mirando from Monterey. Uh, first, I think it's not only a generational debate, but a political culture debate that we should ha be having. I would like to share with you a couple of studies in the Mexican context, of course, uh, that uh, are very sensitive in this matter. The first is the quality of citizenship study by the National Electoral Institute and the Mexican College, where there it says that 90% of the Mexicans have never engaged in any public or social activity whatsoever. And that's not only a political party, that means an NGO, that means a community association, that means helping in the school of your children. Most of them just don't participate. And so there's no real link with your collective context. Uh, other uh, figure that I found very surprising is that 50% of Mexicans believe that politicians doesn't care or would never care for people like them. So they don't see that connection. And 70% 70 of, 70 of the people uh, think they can trust each other as citizens, and much less the government. And the second factor is the absolute predominance of the spoil systems in Mexico. A recent study uh, of the National Auditing Service of the federal government found that only 6% of all public servants at the federal level um, come through a professional or merit system. The other 94% is absolute predominance of the spoil system. That means that they get their jobs as a favor, as a loyalty to have participated or supported a political party or candidate. So there's no door for the millennials to enter the public sector uh, unless it is the political traditional one, but not the merit system. And I think hmm. those two factors are, made, are making um, very unattractive to young Mexicans to see the public sector as an opportunity. 
And I would say it's a gap made of disappointment, distrust, distrust and lack of opportunities. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you for that comment. Uh, we had just received another tweet from Ms. Monique Villa. Uh, she said, we should invite entrepreneurs and innovators to remake the public sector. Um, Dennis, I'm going to turn it to you uh, in Kiev. Well, you know, you've just heard our two esteemed panelists speak. You've heard Alberto speak. What do you have to say in terms of what you think the challenges are of the public sector? Well, uh, it seems that Ukraine is an exception these days mm -hmm. because uh, the conditions of uh, political situation around Ukraine are very famous around the world and somehow we have become the testing ground for uh, the new concepts in the government and in politics. So it seems like there, is a, there are a couple of reasons uh, why people are, especially young people, millennials, mm -hmm. I have certain barriers of uh, entering the uh, army of uh, government officials. Uh, first of all, it seems like uh, the conditions are very aggressive. Uh, there is no financial compensation which might be compared to the market conditions. We, of course, have a civil service reform and uh, somehow it leads to um, creating a special fund which will compensate government officials based on uh, international donors or some other sources. Um, there is no culture of sharing among, among government officials of the previous generations and this creates a lot of moral barriers for young people to come from NGO sector or from business to serve the government. For example, um, I'm coming from NGO sector and I absolutely agree with the previous speaker, Mr. Scott Bryson, that NGOs these days create a tremendous opportunities to do great change. So somehow you feel that you have this opportunity in the government, but at the same time, there are a lot of bureaucratic uh, barriers and you basically struggle to get through them instead of doing things. It also seems that local social attractiveness of government work is because it requires people to have the skill set of achievers and uh, basically those who want to go through big challenges. Some, somehow when you are in the NGO you can take a lower part uh, or lower engagement in solving big problems. You just become one of several people. But when you're in the government, especially in Ukraine, usually you are in a position when you are uh, like the last stand or the last person who can actually uh, solve the problem or make some change. And uh, this creates a very high pressure, a very right. high responsibility. Right, right, Dennis. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Subu, mm. uh, in Mumbai, uh, what are your comments? Yes, uh, so the discussion here in Mumbai was, um, you know, very much in line with some of the points that were discussed earlier, which is that uh, the millennial generation wants to make an impact uh, and wants to uh, you know, uh, seek a sense of purpose in, in what we do. Um, and given that reality, uh, is the public sector equipped enough to, uh, to take them in? I think that was the core of the discussion. Um, the, uh, certain challenges that were identified was one was perceptive, uh, which is that, you know, traditionally the public sector and public services at large uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, construed as too political and too uh, bureaucratic, uh, and is that a place where millennials can make a career? But that was number one. The other was the uh, urban-rural divide that exists uh, in a country like India. So, uh, for an urban millennial vis-a-vis -vis a rural millennial, what are the challenges that could exist? Uh, and the entry barriers might be uh, a little uh, on the, you know, tougher side for millennials to get into. The public sector so uh, lots of examinations lots of paperwork so how could the government make it really easier for millennials to get in uh, especially given that they want to make a difference and they want uh, you know they seek a sense of purpose so how can that be uh, accomplished is what the discussion is about thank you thank you for that Subu. uh laurent we're we're finishing with you from lyon what do you you've heard everybody talk what do you have to say well, I think um, what I would like to, to share with the, uh, the, the panel is actually uh, yet another tale of French exception. 
um, in the sense that uh, France provides a, a useful counterfactual for the debate we are having. Uh, let me back that with some figures. Mm -hmm. uh, according to a recent poll, uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, event split amongst millennials in, in three thirds. And one third of the millennials actually wish to work for the uh, civil service. Uh, then another third would like to just be an employee in the private sector. And the, the last third, uh, they would like to be self-employed, freelance, or uh, create their own startup. So uh, if you zoom in on this one third of the, of the millennials in France who, who would like to work for the, for the civil service, I think you can find two main drivers. Uh, the first one is the sense of the, of the mission and, and frankly, the, the prestige of the, of the function. Uh, France has a strong tradition of a centralized state and a high-flying high career path in the, in the administrative sector. The second driver is actually, uh, and that's the not so good news, that's uh, uh, job security. Uh, that betrays a, a situation where um, you have a country with uh, years and years of uh, very slow, piecemeal growth and, and a, a high uh, unemployment. So the little takeaway from Lyon on, on this round uh, would be that definitely if you don't have enough young people going to the civil service, you have a problem. But on the other hand, if you have too many, that's maybe not desirable. So <laughs> there is a sort of a... Um, find a um, balancing act to, to strike on, the, on this question. All right. Thank you so much, Laurent. Uh, what we can take away from what uh, our speakers have said, uh, our esteemed speakers as well as our hub members, uh, is that th th there seems to be a consensus, except for the little exception in France and perhaps in Ukraine, um, that th there is corruption, government is too political, uh, government reform is needed, um, and uh, we just received uh, another tweet from the Mumbai Global Shaper saying governments can perhaps think of bringing down the age in every department so that it does become millennial friendly. Uh, mm. We're going to move to perhaps presenting solutions on how we can engage millennials in municipal, state, and national uh, level and national levels in public sector. Uh, what do you? think we can do? What do you think the solutions are, Mr. Bryson? Well, what we're, we're hearing is that if we're going to attract millennials to public service, uh, public service has to become less bureaucratic, more meritocratic, uh, less, less partisan, uh, more transparent, uh, and more open. And I think if you asked uh, any citizen of any country, regardless of age, they would view these as as good objectives. Uh, it's particularly important for millennials. And I come back to the point that it's clear that a, a millennial can, you know, a smart millennial can make a big difference in an NGO. But I doubt in, in most cases that somebody leading an NGO can do qu quite as much as a 30 year old cabinet minister like uh, Maryam Monsef in, in, in our cabinet, who is actually making cabinet level decisions. Uh, on the future of the country. NGOs will come to cabinet ministers, they'll come to members of parliament, they will pitch us, but at the end of the day, in a, in a democratic uh, country, the decisions are still made by people who put their names on ballots uh, and who aspire to lead. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that there's a case we can make fervently to millennials. And maybe one of the things we should do is make it easier for people to go from NGOs into the public service for periods of time well, and to go back to the that? NGO how community. How can we do that, Mr. Bryson? Well, I think, what we, is can, a I think we can just do it. I mean, if an NGO comes to see me with an idea uh, as a cabinet minister, uh, we can do two things. We can bring a team of public servants around and listen to the mm -hmm. person and seek to do it. Or we can say to them, look, can you, can you come in as an advisor? to us for a period of time. Um, you know, we should be able to do that, people, young people who are engaged in, as entrepreneurs, to be able to bring them into government for periods of time. I can remember a few years ago in Davos, uh, uh, we were here and we were at a session with Bill and Melinda Gates, and a young person was asking them, they said, look, I'm, I'm graduating, I'm interested in what I'm going to do, what, what kind of career path do you suggest to um, a, uh, an early 20s uh, bright person who wants to make a difference. And Bill Gates said, I used to tell people 
of your age and, and, and education, you should go into either business or science. But he said, I'm telling young people now they should actually go into to government. We need really bright, talented people in government. And he said that since he's, he and, and Melinda started getting involved in the developing world, he learned the importance of good government. And it's not just that a, a smart person in government can make a really positive difference, but somebody who's dumb or corrupt or both <laughs> can really screw things up. And so the point is, at the end of the day, governments make important decisions. And the, the, the complexity of decisions today is greater than it's ever been in the history of, of government or democracy. Now, more than ever at any point in our history, we need bright, talented people in government. And we also have the most talented, most educated, and most globally connected generation. So it seems pretty obvious to me that we need to find ways to bring millennials into this key decision-making roles in government. We're, thank you for that. We're receiving tweets. People are enjoying this discussion. They, we just received a, a tweet from Mayuri Bhattacharji. She's saying millennials should get a chance to interact with honest public service officers to know more about challenges and find inspiration. And this goes back to what you were saying. When, they, when we mention honest, we're talking transparency, openness, uh, and an ability to foster trust. And on that note, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Gallo, um, what do you think, uh, we, how do you think we can present solutions on how we can perhaps redesign career paths uh, that would lead to, the, to public service? I don't know if I have a solution, but I have maybe some questions that uh, could be helpful for, for the debate. The first one, just a little story. I used to work for the World Bank in the Public Sector Reform Unit. So I've been working uh, with, with uh, Public Sector Reform at the World Bank for many years. And because of this, I travel in different countries. And uh, I work a lot in Cambodia, in Zimbabwe, in Ethiopia. And uh, what struck me there wasn't the lack of strategy, intellectual thinking, or at times even funding. It's really the lack of people to deliver. Mm. Mm. And uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. I remember in, in Ethiopia, the uh, Minister of Health, uh, uh, they just didn't get anybody because mm. people used to come, and I hope it doesn't seem like a belligerent statement, to Canada, to the United States, to Europe, because the salary was 20, 30 times more. So one dimension is to say, how do you retain people in their countries in order to provide the value that they, they have? Second, I come from a country where mm. there is a word, I mean, raccomandato. Raccomandato is somebody has got a job because of what our friend in Mexico has shared, because he knows somebody. Uh, I didn't know the statistics in Mexico, 94%, which is uh, somewhere between surreal and scary. And I don't know any statistics in Italy, but it's still a habit in a lot of organizations. When I was head of human resources in a company in Italy, I simply put a policy that if you're a recommendator, you're automatically disqualified, mm -hmm. period. And so that's fundamentally removed uh, the power for people to manipulate the system and to appoint unqualified people to the expense of qualified people. The third example, uh, as we have a ship from Lyon, um, I really believe that um, how many countries they have universities that form and prepare public servant to an extent that is needed. And frankly, I don't know many. Canada is one of them, France is one of them. They have the called the National Administration. And if you look at who has studied there, who passed through there, okay. you see every minister, prime minister, uh, central bank come from there. In many countries, you don't know where you're actually going to start your journey. And this is, to me, something that, in my view, needs to be fixed. And the last point, which is uh, we already mentioned, and some of the shapers have mentioned before, I talk about mental models, but can you really go back to basic? And what I mean by this is what millennials want, what human beings want, is autonomy. Autonomy. They don't want somebody to control them. Two, sense of purpose. We are purpose seekers. We are not profit makers. We are purpose seekers. Three, mastery, the capacity by doing what you're doing to improve what you're doing. Right. And you want to have this sense and last a sense of fairness that the system is fair with you, which is different than trying to make more money. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. It was, you raised a very interesting point. Uh, point here about how Canada and France are uh, both very happy with the public sector uh, in their comments, how there is a, a way to actually engage at an early stage, uh, millennials in uh, the public uh, sector. And that 
could be uh, very much part of the yeah. solution. On that note, uh, um, I, I, go I, ahead. I, Look, I, I don't want to create the impression that we've got it all figured out in no, Canada. No, no, that's not what I said. Uh, because, no, but but I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm telling a story where we're changing things mm -hmm. and it's going to be better. And we have, we have a great professional public service in Canada. We are really well served by an excellent public service. But we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. uh, in terms of engaging millennials more fully in terms of transforming our public service to be more open, more accountable, more transparent, less partisan, just to, you know, and, and something that Gilberto said about the partisanship and the patronage side of things, that there's a feeling that you have to work for a particular political party to, to get a job. Uh, in Canada, our Senate is, is appointed, and I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm approaching any big state secrets here, but in the past, the Senate has been typically appointed based on political service and you know and merit there's merit there's um, but politics and 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 being part of a political party uh, was seen as a path to becoming a, a senator um, today our, our prime minister has announced a new process of senate appointments which is based on on merit which has attracted some very bright uh, uh, eminent, eminent canadians who will actually participate in choosing senators based on merit, not on partisanship, but on merit. And that's a big step in my country, and it, it is representative and emblematic of where we're going to go as a government in terms of merit, not just partisanship. Thank you for that. Hilberto, he was, uh, you, you've heard what our two, uh, what Mr. Bryson and Mr. Gallo were saying. Do you, can you tell us uh, how you think we can engage millennials in municipal, state, and national level employment in public sector? Sure. The, uh, I'm very glad Mr. Gallo mentioned the Ecole Nationale de Administration right. example yes. because I was going to say just that. Uh, we need institutions mm -hmm. that, uh, that assure us that merit can be rewarded. Uh, the first thing I think uh, in the Mexican and I think Latin American context would be to confront the spoil system and work in institutionalizing a real merit system making not only fair but attractive for young people to enter the government. And number two, I think government, governments need to bet on innovation. There's a very interesting book, book by Professor Edward Glazer of Harvard that's called The Triumph of the City, and it's uh, on the urban and um, agenda, but I think the principle is very much the same. He's saying successful places have in common the ability to attract people and enable them to collaborate. I think that's the very same principle governments must follow if they want to engage millennials. And uh, the third thing, I think we need to understand that we have a deeper issue here, a major distrust in public institutions and a little connection of many millennials with their own context and communities. I, I, I would like to share with you a quote from Professor Ed Kaufman, who I historian of the 20th century. And he said, the destruction of the past, or rather the social mechanisms, mechanisms that link one's contemporary experience to that of earlier generations, is one of the most characteristic and eerie phenomena of the late 20th century. Most young men and women at the century's end grow up in sort of a permanent present, lacking any organic relation to the public past of the times they live in. And I think this organic relation with the past with who you are, why your society is the way it is, and the will to change it, what Mr. Gallo was saying, of a sense of purpose, I think is a deeper issue we need to be working on to, to promote and motivate millennials to understand the role they could have in the future. Right. Thank you for that, Gilberto. Very, very inspiring. <laughs> it is. It is. This, this whole discussion is. Um, we just, b before I get to you, Dennis, we just actually received... Uh, a tweet from Alina Opanasenko. Uh, she was saying, as it is discussed in Kiev in the Shaping Talent session, there's a gap not in terms of millennials, but in terms of new thinkers. So could you please tell us how would you think uh, we could redesign career paths in public service? Well, in my experience, uh, it seems like it's crucial to increase the commitment of uh, new coming people to the maximum. Well, um, as far as I can see in Ukraine, it's uh, 
by creating the privilege of serving to the government. Uh, it seems like many people were volunteering uh, to the government it, it itself when um, the revolution was here, but right now those people who definitely know different pains and are experts in different areas want to deliver painkillers in the areas where they feel the, these pains. And that's why the, this should be the project-based selection. Um, volunteers or new millennials are usually uh, thinking in terms of their project. They are not thinking in terms of the government as a whole. They just see certain pain and want basically to solve it. So let them bring their own projects to the government, set the highest responsibility possible, and basically let them start from big, having more authority than advisor volunteers or simply volunteers have. And this seems to be the approach that works here. A lot of projects are ruled by project managers who are coming from civic society and they be or business and they become of volunteers then they become government officials but they are responsible for only one or two projects that they are very special at. Thank you for that. Um, Subu, do you have an idea on how uh, we could close this generational disconnect? We're talking about all these generational gaps. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so uh, the discussion that we had here in, in Mumbai uh, a while ago, uh, you know, was uh, on the fact that perhaps there might not be so much of a generational disconnect uh, in the sense that millennials would probably want uh, a lot of what other generations also want uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, autonomy, mastery and a sense of purpose is something that everybody connects with, right? So it, it becomes that much better for all generations and not just for the millennials. Uh, so keeping that perspective in mind, uh, can we look at uh, redesigning career paths? Can we look at uh, bringing in more role clarity? Uh, can we really, uh, you know, uh, look at driving greater engagement in the public sector? Uh, is is something that uh, you know is something that would be interesting to note and to also talk about. I believe. Um, I think uh, the other point is uh, very specific to the career track uh, is that, uh, you know, just to add on to my point is that uh, millennials also seek a lot of uh, learning and growth, uh, which they uh, find in private sector and uh, entrepreneurial domains. So how could, uh, you know, uh, governments look at redesigning some of those career tracks uh, and also look at shorter career tracks if, if you know, uh, loyalty is something that, that uh, millennials are not attracted to in the longer run. Uh, how do you ensure that uh, you know there are shorter projects uh, for them to be able to accomplish and uh, you know uh, bring impact uh, working on basically? All right, um, Council. Laurent, do you, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, all the more so because um, I, I was myself a civil servant for ten years, and then I, I had to left to leave. So. Um, in two minutes, let, let me give you two ideas about how to close this generational disconnect. Uh, the first one <coughs> would be um, to think about the entrance exam to the civil service. Mm -hmm. um, in France, it's a completely blind exam. So that's really great in terms of fairness, in terms of merit, also in terms of diversity, because you can really join regardless of your background, and that's really great. The problem is, um, the let's say the barrier to entry is so high that once you're in uh, it's very tempting to stay and uh, it becomes like an iron cage and it really takes some nerves to really decide I'm leaving <coughs> so I, I really agree with Subu that uh, new career tries that, that that's probably the, the way to go and bring more flexibility as uh, Minister Raisin was, was mentioning. Uh, Second idea, uh, I, I think that the millennials know a lot more on the fourth industrial revolution than many, many of the civil servants. So we need to find a way to take them on board. Um, when I think of my shapers in, uh, in Lyon, frankly, they know much more about decentralized uh, decision systems, about peer-to-peer -peer learning, about uh, the blockchain and the Bitcoin, and government will need these competencies. Mm. So somehow we need to figure out a way to take them on board, really, to, I think, job descriptions will have to be rewrote completely. Um, reverse mentoring might be a solution. I leave that for, for, for thought for you. Wait, just before we move to our round three, where the hub 
uh, speakers get to ask you questions. I wanted to give each one of you a minute to perhaps uh, respond to what they've been saying. They've been talking about these uh, old-fashioned entrance exams and uh, schools for thoughts in order to uh, train millennials at a younger age. Um, we also just got a uh, a tweet from a Muhammad Ali, not the boxer, uh, saying there's always talk about including millennial and young people, but those hiring the government bypass educated and inexperienced youth. Hmm. Well, uh, first of all, Yumna, um, you're not making it easy for Paolo and, 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 and me because you keep referring to me as Mr. Bryson and him as Mr. Gallo, and that you keep you know referring to our friends. Oh. On, and you make us feel very old here. And, and so, I, Scott, and Scott, reduce our capacity Scott to connect. And Paolo. I, I, it's, it's very uh, ageist. I'm, try, I'm, trying I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to sorry. keep it in I'm the. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, I'm just teasing. You're doing a fantastic job, by <laughs> the way. Thank you. Um, so one of the things we may want to think about, and, I, and I'd be interested in. Uh, what uh, Dennis uh, and Laurent and, and, and Subu and Gilberto may think of this. And I'm going to put uh, Paolo on the spot here. The, the WEF does a really good job through Global Shapers yeah. of engaging young people uh, in a very constructive way. Maybe we should look at, and the WEF could look at, working with some governments, perhaps the Canadian government, I'm mm -hmm. just saying, uh, in terms of internships mm -hmm. within government to enable young global shapers to actually take periods to come into government as interns, to identify areas of interest, uh, to come in. Uh, I know in Parliament, uh, we have parliamentary intern programs, and some of the most impressive uh, Canadians, uh, and in fact, global interns, in fact, I've had uh, interns from, the U U from, from Ukraine, as an example, uh, work in my office over the years. We have had exceptional young people from around the world as interns work in the Canadian Parliament, and I've had the pl privilege of working with, with some of them. Maybe we ought to look at some sort of internship program mm -hmm. working with the WEF to give uh, young global shapers or to give global shapers an opportunity to actually work within government in key areas. To learn, it, it's not easy to, to make a difference in government. If you're in an NGO and you're doing one thing and you're focusing on one thing, it's a, it's a little easier. What you find in government is, is there's all kinds of unintended consequences to particular decisions. There's all kinds of barriers to change. Maybe in government, you can help us bring down some of those barriers and we can help you in some ways understand the complexity of government because it's really important that you have a role in helping shape it. That's just an idea that, mm. that uh, may make sense. Yeah. I'm happy to contribute on this one. <laughs> now, perhaps uh, um, two, two quick points. The first one is about mentality and the second one is actually looking at what we're already doing that could work in other places. Uh, mentality. I've been able to go around the globe in, to, in presenting my organization, work in different places before. And uh, basically the mantra was, if you're very, very smart at university, you end up at McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. uh, you're yeah. okay, you're going to you know, end up in some local company. If you're not that smart, you're going to be in the public sector. Um, so, except France, where I believe, and again, I, it's not that I'm not French, okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, um, in this country, actually, and even in England, uh, end up in the public sector, in the central bank or, or whatever, is actually the pinnacle of your career. And so we also mm. have to contribute to, to a different narrative, and these are the leaders that contribute to a different narrative. Here right. there are many leaders, right. that's one. Second, look at the global shapers. The global shapers, I, my colleagues know that I absolutely love these guys for different reasons. The first one is what they do, okay? There are 5,000 of them, 450 hubs, fantastic. The second for the teaching that we get from them in an indirect way. Let me tell you what I mean by this. One, do, they, do we pay them for doing what they're doing? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. do, they tell, do we tell them what they have to do? Mm -hmm. No, they don't. Do we control what they're doing? No, we don't. Do we have managers or human resources monitoring performance mm. and compensation? No, they don't. And guess what? This is a phenomenal community that is mushrooming based on an idea of Professor Schwab five years ago because these people have understood the purpose mm -hmm. and they put so much energy, integrity and passion in what they're doing despite this, all these guys, they have something mm -hmm. else to do. They, yeah. they, they have something else to do. So to me, this lesson from the shapers is not about the impact that they have in the local community, which is phenomenal, but also the teaching that us 
as a policy makers, mm -hmm. as a practitioners in whatever metier, should probably take take really seriously and try to propagate in other organizations. Thank you for mm. that. Uh, you raised a lot of very good points. Um, we're going to turn it to our hub speakers. Uh, Dennis, you were smiling oh so joyfully as uh, Mr. Bryson was talking. Do you want to go first? Scott, Scott, oh. Scott. <sighs> Scott and Paolo, uh, it's get, get this right. Dennis, okay. Dennis, <laughs> we've got, Dennis, we've got it's difficult, huh? Scott Bryson and Paolo Gallo <laughs> here. Um, in 30 no. seconds, because we have to move uh, to the other shapers, what, who do you want to ask a question to and what is your question? So, so a quick remark and uh, the question to Mr. Scott Bryson. So maybe it's um, just an interesting situation, but at the same time, uh, I've met a group of uh, very keen and talented uh, Ukrainian diaspora from Canada, I guess a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, what they offered is basically to boost the government of Ukraine by setting up the global contest for basically Ukrainian diaspora people from around the world to basically unite with their native country and come back and help the government to rebuild the trust of the society. And it seems like, well, basically it could be used vice versa because uh, maybe some Ukrainians would like to have an internship abroad and basically use the experience that they have here. And um, I'm not quite sure, but maybe it requires an effort to take it to another level. If uh, there is a certain political will, maybe it makes sense to basically uh, create this uh, talent bridge between Canada and Ukraine mm -hmm. and uh, help people to connect at least at the middle level of the government just to exchange certain experience. I, I really like that idea, Dennis, and in fact uh, I'd like to have a conversation with, with uh, my cabinet colleague Christia Freeland, who's a Ukrainian-Canadian who is Minister of Trade uh, in, our, in our government. Uh, she also was a YGL uh, in the past of WEF. In fact, I'm, I'm uh, one of uh, two YGLs, or former YGLs, we're, we're too old to be YGLs now, we're, we're OGLs or something like that. Um, but the, uh, 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 but Christia is a leader in our cabinet and uh, certainly on, on Ukra Ukraine issues is really important. We also have Marianne Mahaychuk, who's another uh, Ukrainian Canadian who's a member of our cabinet, so if, who's Minister of Labor. Um, we ought to continue this discussion, and um, I'm, I'm sure Yumna can help, uh, or uh, after with, with the WEF can with the WEF can help connect us after. But it, it, that makes some some sense. We've and got uh, thank you. We've got thank so you. many tweets coming in from the uh, Mumbai Global Shapers. Uh, the last one that came in, basically saying that millennials really value the opportunity for impact, and what better than the public services? We agree. Yeah, abs um, absolutely. And in fact, in fact, uh, I have several cabinet ministers uh, in our government who are in Indo-Canadians, uh, who are very important and senior uh, uh, members of our of our cabinet. In, in fact, my my chief of staff, who's sitting with us today, is a part of that community uh, as well. So there's uh, we have a, just a strong community uh, of Indo-Canadians who are uh, shaping the future of Canada as well. Thank you. Uh, Alberto, in 30 seconds, uh, what is your question to our panelists? Sure. I think it would be uh, very precise how governments can benefit from merit. And I also believe this, can, this should become a strong public narrative because what they lose uh, in the spoil system, they can gain politically with better functioning governments. And I think the uh, public opinion would feel that. But I think. Um, what, what would be for you the main benefits uh, from merit to build this public narrative? Who, who is your question addressed to? Both. All right. Do you want to start? Mr. No, Gump. Gump. Well, Gilberto, you're, you're asking about um, merit. And one of the things that when we talk about diversity in government, we also often talk about diversity in terms of it being good for the groups represented. Uh, for instance, people say we need more women in senior leadership roles, and they say it's good for women. Um, I actually, as an example, I actually think that's the wrong argument, and I think diversity in and of itself 
is good for better decisions. Uh, this is my second time in a cabinet. I served in a cabinet uh, um, uh, 10 years ago before our government was defeated, our party was defeated. And, and during that time, I remember at cabinet, um, women brought a different perspective to decision making and, and it rendered better decisions having women at the table. Now that I'm at, in a cabinet where we have gender parity and we have so much diversity, I find the perspective from uh, a minister uh, representing a totally different background than mine is really valuable. And having the diversity of, of opinions and backgrounds in a decision-making uh, setting creates better decisions. So I think that is inherently merit. So diversity and merit go hand in hand, and more diverse organizations are inherently, in my view, more meritorious. It's not a question of in the past where quotas, you know, uh, almost were seen as being counter meritocratic. I actually think in today's context, there's a lot of there's a lot of diverse meritocratic voices who need to be part of decision making. Um, Gilberto, in just five seconds. Uh, I also believe that we have to play a fair game with, with the players. And what I mean by this is the following. The investment per child uh, in in US, in Canada, in, in Europe, most of the country in Europe, in this uh, 14 or to 15 years school period is 100,000 per, per child. Yeah. Uh, in Africa is $100. Mm. So in a way, uh, if we want to open up to the millennials, it's not only about the schooling system, but policy makers uh, with, the, with the finance minister probably should probably sit down and think seriously about the investment that they do or they don't do in certain countries. Uh, mm -hmm. Some countries are spectacularly doing well. I think Canada is number two or three on, on, on this kind of issues. But most of the countries that I have the opportunity to work with in, in my past experience, they, the debate about the millennia doesn't even start because these people do not have the chance to be a millennia. All right. right. Um, oh, one, one of the... Um, uh, challenges and opportunities we have in, in Canada is that our youngest and fastest growing population in Canada are Indigenous peoples and Indigenous mm -hmm. youth. Mm -hmm. It is also a population that is the most economically and socially disenfranchised. So one of the challenges and opportunities our government has is, is to change that. And it's going to take time and we're, we're going to invest in, in education. We're going to invest in young people and we're going to try to close that gap because if the fastest growing and youngest population in Canada uh, has an opportunity to enter the workforce with the skills they need to compete and succeed, that would be good economically. If they don't, that is economically and socially disastrous. So uh, one of the, the things we want to do as a government is a better job of giving young Indigenous Canadians an opportunity uh, to play a serious role in shaping the future of our country. Our justice minister in our cabinet is an Indigenous woman, as an example, and, and, and uh, we, have, uh, we have also uh, our, our fisheries minister. And again, it, this, is, this is an opportunity. Our cabinet looks like Canada. And the degree to which decision-making bodies can look like the people being represented uh, and reflect their values, their interests, um, and their backgrounds, I think can make a real difference. All right. Thank you for that. We're, we're closing in on time, so I just want to keep going. Um, Subu, just a quick note. I, there should be an award for the Mumbai Global Shapers <laughs> for the record number of tweets in an hour, so you'll thank them on our behalf. Um, uh -huh. Do you have a, in 30 seconds, we're running out of time. Do you have a question for our panelists, any one of our panelists? Uh, yes, I do have one question, uh, which is that, uh, you know, India is at a, India is at a unique um, uh, point in its evolution in the sense that uh, we are digitally shaping up as a country, I think, across, uh, uh, you know, uh, because we are so diverse as a nation, uh, there are lots of rural communities that, are, that have smartphones today uh, and are uh, connected through broadband. Given that reality, uh, because uh, you know that that part of the shift is happening much faster and it will happen much uh, quicker in the future, in the near future. Uh, any thoughts on how uh, the participation from citizens could be activated at the municipal state or uh, the central levels? Any thoughts either of the speakers could uh, you know, contribute here? Mr. Ah, very briefly, a lot of organizations have the same issues and they tend to solve the problem by having the people selecting the people get into the system, the very same people that want to enter into the system. So as long as you have, let's say, 
uh, 55 years old, all of, all of them dressed like me right now, incidentally, uh, taking the decision, you would not get the inclusiveness that you need to have. So you have to dismantle the system and have the very same people that you need to bring in taking the decision to, to get there. So when you change this recruitment system and when you change the, the selection criteria, you usually get a better system. Otherwise, you're just playing with processes, you don't get results. Thank you yeah. on that. Let's just take one last question. Laurent, uh, the last question is yours, uh, 30 seconds. Yes, a very quick one. Uh, I would like to circle up with the, um, the theme of the annual meeting, the fourth industrial revolution. And um, we know that uh, more and more high qualified jobs are at stake with, uh, so with artificial intelligence and uh, even jobs as lawyers will be destroyed probably and I was just I just wanted to ask the, panel, the, the panelists what they think will happen with the jobs in the civil service and, um, and the needs for human resources in the future in this, in this line in, uh, in the functions related to sovereign states. Well you, you've asked a question it's, 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 it's hard to the, the rapidity of change today is such that uh, uh, all of us are challenged in understanding exactly what the impacts will be. But one thing is, is clear, that throughout people's careers uh, and life cycles, they will need to be skilled and will need to, to get more skills and to change their skills throughout their uh, career and life cycle. Um, that's something that we need to do a better job within government to enable people to grow within government, to leave government, to come back to government. And at a time, you know, there's a lot of challenges economically, globally right now, and there's very high levels of youth unemployment and underemployment in a lot of our countries. At the same time, uh, we need smart uh, decision makers and, and drivers of change within government. It strikes me that, that this makes a lot of sense to have this conversation right now and to create the changes that can give young people, mil millennials, an opportunity to enter government and to be drivers of change. And um, I would hope that the four of you and all the other millennials who are participating in this would engage. We can have this as a longer conversation that the WEF can, can help uh, sponsor and and um, uh, make happen but but I really think this is an incredibly important issue to the future success of our governments and our countries and if we the countries that get this right are going to really succeed in a big way in terms of building a better future for their citizens and shaping a better future for the world I'll be totally biased I want Canada to be one of those countries. I want Canada to lead the charge on this, and so does my Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So I'm going to be making a pitch to millennials from around the world to work with our government and to work with their governments to be vehicles of positive change and to shape a brighter future. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Scott Bryson and Paolo Gallo. Thank you so much to our two panelists. and. Our hub speakers, Ilberto from Monterey, Dennis from Kiev, Subu from Mumbai, and Laurent from Lyon. Thank you so much for joining in. And thank you to our audience and to the people watching us uh, across the globe. Thank you for thank tuning you. in. We hope you enjoyed the session of Shaping Davos. And on that note, this brings our session to a close. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.